All right, so today we're going to do 6-2. Remember, Unit 6 <clears throat> is cities and urban land use, right? And you can see this picture here of what is a break of bulk center, which is really something you'll get when we get to the next unit, Unit 7 on economics. But uh, here's our objectives. We're going to talk about mega cities and meta cities, okay? And, and their distinct spatial outcomes of urbanization, increasingly located in countries on the periphery, and semi-periphery, and we'll explain what those things are, as opposed to the core, right? And uh, so that's the core periphery model. That's Wallerstein. We'll get to him in a minute. And then the second part of this has got a bunch of terms. Uh, suburbanization, sprawl, decentralization have created new land use forms, including ed cities, exurbs, boom burbs, boom burbs, um, and challenges that come along with those. Okay, remember from the last one, right? And cities are getting bigger, urban areas are getting bigger. Uh, most people in the world, over 50% now, live in an urban area. So, this is a result of that. Okay, so here's Wallerstein's world system theories model. Okay, it's really important that you understand this. So, there's the core, okay, and the core, right? They uh, utilize the periphery and the semi periphery countries. Okay, so the periphery countries are typically the less developed countries. They provide cheap labor and raw materials to the core countries. The core countries then have high profit consumption goods that they get from the periphery. It's like in America, the clothes that I'm wearing, that you're wearing. This is for World War II, by the way. And I've been wearing a helmet all day, so my hair is a mess. Uh, but we benefit from cheap labor in places like Pakistan or Bangladesh, right, or even China. Okay, and then the, those are the periphery areas, then they send those things back to us. So there's the core countries, which are really the more developed countries. And then there's the semi-periphery who are kind of in the middle, a place like Brazil, right, maybe even Mexico. Then there's the periphery where people are really poor um, and they're kind of uh, taken advantage of in some ways by the core countries. All right, so the core periphery model is all about dependencies. Countries do not exist alone. We all depend upon each other. You can see that from here. Right, countries depend upon each other. Uh, this was originally called the World Systems Model, and this was developed by a historian, a guy named Emmanuel Wallerstein, in the 1970s. Okay, so Wallerstein is the core periphery model. All right, okay, so core countries have they're economically advanced, okay, they're the centers of business and finance, they're the headquarters of most multi or transnational corporations. Okay, so places like Nike, the headquarters are here, but they don't make Nike goods here. Okay, they're made overseas somewhere, right? These countries have higher skill, capital intensive production. Okay, uh, they dominate the semi periphery and the periphery by paying low wages and exploiting weak environmental laws. So that's neo colonialism, right? That's how, even though colonialism is basically dead, like one country doesn't control another country, this still happens economically because we know they need jobs in those places. So we send our factory work over there because they work for a lot cheaper. And that helps the, us as the host country, right, of the core country. Uh, so they benefit big time in international trade, okay, big time. The core countries benefit, right? And you can see that back here, okay? They benefit because of the cheap labor and the raw materials, okay, that are available in those periphery countries. All right, so semi-periphery countries include middle-income countries or emerging economies, Um that's, again, a place like Brazil is a good example of that, Argentina. Um, so they provide the core with manufactured goods and services, right? The periphery countries are the LDCs, okay, the least d developed countries. Uh, lots of low-skill, labor-intensive production. Usually these are, are high areas of population because those people need jobs. And so we send them over there, the factory work over there. They make the factory over there. The people take those jobs, and they're happy to have them. Okay, they do a lot of primary economic activities. This is a place that would have a lot of uh, intensive agriculture. Okay, they provide the core and the semi-core with the raw materials, the labor, and the agricultural production. Okay, they don't profit very much from their manufacturing. They, they get the jobs, but they don't get the finished product, which is where the money's at. Okay, there's weak laws to protect the environment uh, and the worker, so the worker doesn't have very many rights. Uh, in these countries, and the environmental laws are kind of ignored because they want the jobs, right? So NAFTA is the old agreement between the United States, Mexico, and Canada where the jobs went to Mexico because in Mexico, you don't have to worry about paying your workers a lot. You don't have to worry about environmental laws as much as you would in the United States. So in that case, 
Mexico would be a periphery country, kind of a semi-periphery country, but a periphery country supplying the labor for uh, Canada and the United States. Okay, so a mega city is this what it sounds like? It's an urban area with 10 million people. Okay, but it's a city. It's one place. So like New York City, together the metropolitan area is 10 million people, right? Uh, so it's over 10 million. New York City is like 18 million, right? Places like Shanghai, Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. Excuse me, Shanghai, China, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, right? And then there's a meta city. So this is a large agglomeration of cities, which means they're all together like in the same place. It's heterogeneous, which means it's got a bunch of different uh, social groups, right? It's a dynamic urban region, multiple dense centers, okay? There's suburbs, there's green spaces. Um, they diffuse boundaries between traditional cities, suburbs, and exurb. It's like one continuous city, okay? New York City is also an example of a meta city. Lagos, Nigeria, okay? Nairobi, Kenya. Right. These are all emerging meta cities because, as we mentioned earlier, tons of people flocking to these places. OK, so what's the impact of this? So there's transportation because if you got all these people, you got to move them back and forth somehow. OK, housing production. Where do these people go to live? Do we have high rise buildings that are going to be government owned that house these people? Do you have high rise buildings that the people are going to buy themselves? Do you have shanty town, broken down places that are called favelas in many parts of the world, slums? In other parts of the world um, landscape preferences so like you know what's the cultural landscape of the area is it reflect the economics right does it affect the uh reflect the income and then social and demographic trends so like when people move to the cities what changes right do they get more of a chance for education okay do women get more shots at employment right because they're in the city so those things will change a little bit because they move uh, okay so mega cities are typically in the core regions and meta cities are typically in the semi periphery. Okay. Um, we'll talk more about that though. All right. So here's a great map of it. You can see the red, okay, is the over 10 million places. And look at how big like Tokyo is in Japan. Okay. I look at Shanghai in China. Okay. I look at Calcutta in India, right? Mexico City, Los Angeles, New York. Okay. Uh, these are over 10 million, making them mega cities, right? Uh, it's amazing how many places on earth there are. Heck, look at uh, Mumbai and Karachi and Lahore, right? There are so many of them over there in India It's in Pakistan. It's unreal. Okay. Uh, all right. So global patterns of population in 2015. This shows you again. Okay. And you can see that there's more of these popping up in the southern hemisphere now. Okay. The uh, equator it literally goes through the middle of Africa there underneath the... the West Africa part. So, I mean, most of it's in the Northern Hemisphere, but there's an increasing amount of these places in the Southern Hemisphere as well. So spatially, right, the world population is moving a little bit more south. Uh, they're not really moving and there's just a lot more growth in those places. Uh, okay, so urban growth per hour. Okay, I mean, look at Delhi in India, man. 79 people per hour are moving there. Okay, now that's an average, right? But Manila in the Philippines, Kinshasa, okay, down in Africa, Lagos in Nigeria, okay, uh, Rio de Janeiro, Mexico City. You can see that those places are just exploding. And New York is the biggest city in America, but you're still only looking at plus 10, okay, per, and this is again per hour, show you how fast that these places are growing. Uh, okay, how does the growth affect a country, right? Transportation, again, how, what's the infrastructure? Are you going to get light rail? Are you going to move these people back and forth uh, by railway, or is it going to be uh, because of roads? Uh, is it going to be just an old system of walking, which probably isn't going to work very good? Uh, what's the poverty going to be like, right? You're, you're, it's going to be, in the beginning, you're going to be slammed with all these people, and it's going to be hard to put them somewhere. It's going to be hard to employ all of them. But the good news is you're moving into stage three and four on the demo demographic transition model, if you remember that, which means the literacy rate's going up, more and more people are getting educated. There's better access to health care. Okay, things are becoming more modern. So because there's a bunch of people moving in, the birth rate, though, starts to go down. Okay, so things will level off over the course of time. But boy, that brunt in the beginning is really tough for transportation and the stress on the infrastructure. Uh, this happens in the periphery and the semi-periphery countries. It doesn't really happen in America, okay, because people already have places to live and we're so spread out. There's no one primate city that dominates the population. So here's Lagos, Nigeria. This is a meta city, okay.
okay, that's on the periphery. And you can see the problem with transportation. I mean, look at this crowdedness. It's crazy. But you can also see some modern things in here. Okay, you can see the stoplights, okay, that are in the middle of the road, right? That's a positive sign, right, that you have that kind of infrastructure there. Now, do they need more roads? Absolutely. Okay, they need more roads. Um, and they are in the beginning of this. So over the course of time, you know, 20, 30 years, this will settle down a little bit. Okay, in a place like Lagos. Here's another look. Oops. Uh, Nairobi, Kenya. In this case, right, the urban core, and the same is true in, in Lagos. So the urban core, like the center, the central business district inside of Lagos, is going to look pretty modern. Okay, it, this does not look modern, right? So here's an example with both. If you look at the picture underneath Nairobi, Kenya, man, that's a mess. That's a railway that runs through that housing area, and that guy's walking along the railway like, that's not good. That's not developed at all. But man, that's the same city as the picture on the right. Okay, the urban center is modern and nice, right? It's got a central business district. The infrastructure, though, on the outside can't keep up because so many people are moving. Eventually, though, they'll catch up, okay, and things will get fixed a little bit. Uh, okay, so when people move to the cities, more education and healthcare is available. Less kids are needed because you don't work on the farms anymore. So population growth slows down, and birth rate goes down. But in the meantime, you have a huge boom in population, so it's a problem, right? Okay, here's some new terms for you. You've heard of these, though. Suburbanization is people moving from the city, from the urban areas, to residential areas on the outskirts of cities. Uh, areas are still connected with the urban area with transportation network, okay? Highways and high-speed rail. Look at Belleville, connected to St. Louis. You can get there on the interstate. You can get there on the Metrolink, okay? We are a suburb, right? That's part of suburbanization, all right? Um, and there are all kinds of suburbs, Alton, Edwardsville, Swansea, Fairview Heights, all suburbs of St. Louis. And every city, especially in the developed world, has these. Uh, okay, so why does this happen? There's government programs for loans. Uh, the uh, bid rent theory, right? That the further you go away from the core, the land gets cheaper. So you can buy a house further away from the city for way less than you can buy land inside the city. Um, there's better transportation now. Okay, there's something called white flight that I think we talked about in the culture unit where uh, white people move in crazy numbers out of the city that they used to live in, okay, to get further away from the urban core, okay? They're doing that for educational reasons. Some people do that for racist reasons, and they get they get out because they don't want to live by in a diverse community, okay? Now, that is slowing a little bit, but that used to happen big time, okay, big time. So uh, there's lack of investment in the inner city. You can see how things are run down because they haven't invested in it. Um, the industry jobs that used to be in the city leave, and I always use the the, uh, oh, the city museum as an example. That used to be a shoe factory. You know, like 50 years ago, there were tons of people that worked there literally putting shoes together. Well, that moved out, right? So when that, if you lived near there, you, you could walk to work. Well, that factory has gone. So when that factory has gone, the people got to move and go somewhere else, right? So this is also known as decentralizing, right? So you move out. So you don't have that big urban core anymore. Now it's spread out over a bigger region. The problem is the urban core remains, except now it's neglected because there's not nearly as many people that live there. Uh, so suburban sprawl, right? It's a massive, massive growth of these suburbs, and it extends way out away from the city. So uh, my son, Will, and the daughters play volleyball over in St. Louis at what used to be the Mills Outlet Mall, but the whole place is closed down. Okay, it's way out there. It's like way out in St. Charles. Well, it's still in St. Louis County, but it's right on the edge. Um, and it's connected. There's You can get there by Interstate 70. You can get there by Interstate 370. Like, it's easy to get there. And the reason the mall is located there is because of the transportation network, right? So it made this suburb out there. Well, heck, they built these malls out there, and now people have stopped going to malls. That mall sits empty, and it's just, just huge concrete nothing out in the middle of nowhere. Okay, that's a good example of suburban sprawl and why it's not so great. Okay, sometimes that could still be productive farmland, but we chose not to do that. Uh, okay, so here is a map, a chart. And man, look at that growth in the red. Okay, the 35, and then it goes up with a purple or maroon line or whatever that is. So in 1950, you had 35 million people that lived in a suburb. Okay, by uh, 2010, 2015, that number had quadrupled to 158 million. Okay, that's crazy. Okay, that's crazy. We're in the central city, the population has gone up too. Um, 
but that that's just out of control that hasn't gone up as much right so the suburbs are definitely expanding belleville is way bigger now than it used to be okay uh all right in edge city so that's a city that's in it is a suburb but it has large commercial centers so you have hotels and malls and restaurants and office complexes okay typically these are right along an interstate outside of the city the best example around here is clayton missouri okay clayton's got high-rise buildings there's all kinds of commercial uh, stuff there for people to work at there's business headquarters right there's a nice downtown clayton area okay that is the best example of an edge city fairview heights is pretty close uh, because you have the mall, you have all kinds of offices and stuff that are over by the mall. And then you have like the Dick Sporting Goods and the Fresh Time. And there's a Raising Cane's going in there, right? The Petco, the, you know, the Barnes and Noble, all that stuff is over there. So there's all kinds of retail that's available there. Uh, what would it take for Belleville? You'd have to have downtown Belleville really get a ton of like hotels uh, and make it more of a destination place. And then more businesses, more high rise buildings that had businesses in it. Uh, okay, so this is kind of what an edge city would look like. Okay, uh, an exurb, right, is again, a kind of an example of a suburb, but it's a little different. This is a prosperous region, okay, that's beyond the suburbs. People can work remotely using technology, right, so they don't have to come to work uh, like they did before. So migrants move to the city, right, and then some of those re the residents that were there say, I'm out of here, I'm moving out, okay, and they go out to the suburbs. Uh, people have moved to St. Charles County. When I was in high school, I think there was one Francis Howell school, and now I think there's four, and that's all St. Charles County. Okay, so their population has skyrocketed. There's a place called Newtown St. Charles we'll talk about later in this district. So I think it's called the Orchard Hills School District. Didn't even exist 20 years ago, and now they've got thousands and thousands of students. Okay, well, people have moved out to St. Charles. Their headquarters for the job might be in St. Louis, but they never go there they work outside uh, of the city, right? They work way out in the, ex in the exurbs. Uh, Boom Burbs is an accidental city and it's a suburb that grew so large it became into a city. So they didn't anticipate it when they started. Uh, Anaheim, California is a real good example of this. And that's where Disney World is now, but it's right outside of LA. It didn't start this way, okay? Uh, Naperville, Illinois is another example. Here's a picture of downtown Naperville. So like we have downtown Belleville, this is downtown Naperville. So they have all the restaurants that you have in Chicago. All of those things exist in Naperville. And it's super high end, right? Uh, expensive retail places. Uh, so there's an exurb, right? Regions farther away from the suburbs. The suburbs are the outer stretches of a city, um, but it's very well connected. The exurbs are connected, but it's going to take you a little bit longer to get there. And you probably don't have light rail that'll get you from an exurb into the urban core. Uh, okay, so where did all this begin? That's going to bring us to the end here. Um, so remember, this is our objectives here. I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning, okay, to talk about the objectives. Uh, there it is. So mega cities and meta cities. Meta cities have 20 million. Mega is 10. Okay, and meta cities are really spread out. Uh, spatial outcomes of urbanization are located in countries on the periphery and the semi-periphery. Don't forget Wallerstein's model. Okay, and then the processes, and it's kind of a bunch of terms here, suburbanization, sprawl, which is the mall I gave you the example of, um, decentralization have created new land use forms, edge cities, exurb, boombergs. Okay, and with all of those, though, there comes new challenges. Heck, like in the exurbs and the boombergs, they're way out there, but they have to have hospitals, right? So you think there's a Barnes West now that's way out in Chesterfield, okay, because the population's moving out there. Heck, even Memorial Hospital, Okay, and St. Elizabeth's Hospital. Now there's kind of like a hospital corridor out near O'Fallon, right? Because the population's moving away, so now you need those in those new places. So the response is to those challenges as things change a little bit. Uh, okay, the end.